On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I am Manpreet Singh Anand, a trustee of the World Affairs Council and your moderator. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest. Dr. Stephen A. Cook is Hasib J. Sabag, Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is an expert on Arab and Turkish politics, as well as U.S. Middle East policy. He has published widely in a variety of foreign policy journals, opinion magazines, and newspapers, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and The Wall Street Journal. Dr. Cook is also a frequent commentator on radio and television. Prior to joining CFR, Dr. Cook was a research fellow at the Brookings Institution and a SOARF research fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He holds a BA in International Studies from Vassar College and MA in International Relations from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and both an MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Cook speaks Arabic and Turkish and reads French. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen A. Cook. I'm here to talk about the momentous events in, uh, in the Middle East and uh, my new book, uh, The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square. What I thought I'd do tonight is start out with two anecdotes um, uh, about what uh, has happened to me in actually the run-up and, and during the during the uprising, and then get into uh, what has happened uh, in Egypt uh, since the uprising, and, and what is happening now, and what may or may not be be happening. But let me let me start out uh, telling you about a meeting uh, to which I was invited, um, in which, um, uh, along with a number of colleagues, outside experts, uh, traditional academics, and, and think tankers like myself, were invited by an organization called the National Intelligence Council to come and spend a day uh, talking to them about the Middle East. Now, the National Intelligence Council is one of um, a myriad of intelligence agencies uh, that make up the US intelligence community. And the National Intelligence Council is generally made up of people who are uh, quite experienced. Uh, they would be uh, senior faculties on uh, political science and history and sociology departments. And their job is to do long range thinking uh, about the world. And as I said, I was invited along with a number of others. And if you live in Washington and you do what I do, uh, from time to time, you will be invited uh, to do this kind of thing. And, and from the perspective of the intelligence community, we provide an external check for, uh, for the things that they're thinking so that they don't get, uh, get infused with groupthink. And uh, the topic of the day's discussion were the prevailing and dominant trends in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. And roughly speaking, the foreseeable future is the next three to five years. Well, after uh, a, a very, very interesting day of discussion and debate, and dare I say even argument, uh, the general conclusion was that uh, the prevailing, the dominant political trend in the Middle East for the foreseeable future was political stability and that the barriers to collective action uh, for uh, generally weak and divided oppositions were so great that leaders in the region really didn't have much to fear over the course of uh, the ensuing three to five years. The date of that meeting? <laughs> December 13th, 2010. Three days before the Tunisian uprising began. Fast forward uh, five weeks, and I am in Cairo. I had just finished the first draft of the struggle for Egypt. I was feeling pretty good, and it had been a struggle. I wanted to call it this my struggle for Egypt, but my uh, <laughs> editors didn't think that was a good idea. And uh, I found myself on January 25th in Tahrir Square uh, with 25 to 30,000 uh, predominantly young Egyptians demanding an end to the Mubarak regime demanding that the president of Egypt join his colleague, the former president of Tunisia in Jidda, Saudi Arabia, and demanding a more democratic future uh, for Egypt. And one of my many reactions upon entering Tahrir Square after spending about two hours trying to get in was, I have it on very good authority that this is not happening. I just attended a meeting with the National Intelligence Council and told me that the dominant trend in the region was uh, political stability. How, in fact, is this happening? And that is a great question. How did this happen? 
and and why did it happen? Now, I can't tell you why it happened on January 25th, other than the fact that uh, the instigators of the uprising chose January 25th because it is police day in Egypt. It actually commemorates uh, a moment in, a very important moment in the run-up to uh, the coup d'etat of uh, 1952, uh, although police day is a relatively new, uh, a new holiday in Egypt. I suspect it won't be celebrated ever again, but nevertheless, um, uh, I, I do remember after being in Egypt at the outset of the uprising and coming home uh, on, the, on the fourth day, I, I caught one of the last direct flights from Cairo to the United States before the airport closed. I had intended on staying, but my wife told me that I wasn't allowed to, so I, I came home. And um, I remember the chairperson of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, a senior senator from the great state of California, stating that she wanted to conduct an investigation into the intelligence community for having missed the Egyptian revolution. And my reaction was, somebody hands Senator Feinstein a book about revolutions. By their very nature, they are unpredictable. The, all that being said, it does not absolve people like myself and others uh, who have been looking at the region for quite some time of our responsibility for um, mostly getting it wrong. Um, Although in my first draft of my book, I did have a short epilogue suggesting that perhaps uh, that this country was not as stable as people had made it out to be. And in that meeting at the National Intelligence Council, my, my final words were if I was a betting man, which I'm not, but if I was a betting man, I'd count on stability, but that I was um, uh, not a technical term, but I had a hinky feeling about what was going on in Egypt in particular. Well, well why did we get it wrong? Which is very important uh, in going forward in understanding what's happened in Egypt and what's likely to happen in Egypt. And uh, I think there are two things that uh, experts uh, got wrong. First, we were so obsessed with regime politics. What was going on among the critical constituencies that made up this regime, the, the military, the internal security services, big business, regime-affiliated intellectuals, what they were doing, and we were looking at whether they were sticking with the leadership or determining that their interests were better served by joining the opposition or just breaking from the leadership uh, more generally. And that really didn't happen. Actually, it did happen. It happened in Tunisia on January 14, 2011, the day that the military pushed Ben Ali from power. It did happen in Egypt on February 10th and 11th when the military pushed Mubarak from power. But these things happened too late, too late for them to be analytically useful. What we were really looking for were to have these breaks within the regime or cracks within the regime as a signal for society to organize. And that would be a signal to us that these regimes were on the ropes, when in fact it was the other way around societies organized producing cracks within the regime. So essentially, we had the narrative backwards. Our expectations were backwards. The other problem was, um, how many people here, by a show of hands, have ever purchased a mutual fund? Raise your hand. OK. And you know how when you purchase the mutual fund, you get uh, a prospectus in the mail or by email these days, and the first thing you do is either throw it out or delete it? which you're not supposed to do, you're supposed to read it. If you do read it, somewhere buried on page 39 in the smallest possible font you can see, there's a line that all of these things have. And what does it say? It says, past results do not guarantee future res returns. Well, we made the mistake of expecting that past results would guarantee future returns because leaders in the Middle East had, had this seeming capacity to muddle through what one would think would be regime-ending crises. Uh, go back to June 1967. We're very, very polite in the United States. We call the June War a six-day war. Well, on the Egyptian front, it was three days. Israeli forces ended up on the east bank of the Suez Canal on June 8th. That was a three-day war. Um, yet the Egyptian regime never faltered. Uh, fast forward, a more contemporary example. In early 1992, uh, a group of 60 Algerian military officers canceled the country's first free and fair election, which plunged the country into a decade of civil war, killing upwards of 100,000 people. Yet the regime in Algeria never faltered. Uh, Iraq, 
uh, Saddam Hussein survived the 100-hour war. Forget the 46 days of bombing beforehand in March 1990 or early 1991. And then the subsequent 12 years of sanctions, yet his regime never actually faltered. Yes, there were challenges, but they came out on the other side. And so outside experts and academics and government officials uh, engaged in a, a whole research project trying to understand why this was the case. Uh, and uh, examining the ostensible uh, strength and suppleness of uh, institutions in, in countries in this part of the world for their ability to somehow deflect and manage challenges to the regime. This all proved to be not really true because uh, Ben Ali fell in, 18, in, a, in a month. Mubarak fell in 18 days. Oh, it took a little longer in Libya, uh, but he fell. Uh, and it's certainly taking longer in Syria. We don't know what will happen here, but nevertheless, uh, these uh, regime challenges seem to be quite serious. And everything that we expected about the Middle East turned uh, uh, on, on its head. So what is it? What should we have been looking at? I'll go through this pretty quickly. There are essentially three ways in which leaders uh, either elicit the loyalty of their people or establish control over them. One is vision. To have that, that was a George Bush, first George Bush, that vision thing. Uh, and I'm not being flip. Uh, I'm talking about a positive vision for the future that is emotionally and materially satisfying for the largest number of people. Uh, that's a very jargony, geeky, social science-y way of saying something along the lines of the American dream. Um, think about it. You know, you can grow up in a you know, bedroom community of New York City. Your parents aren't connected to anybody. You work very hard. You get into a good college. You study languages hard. You get into a good graduate school. You do well. And you wake up one day, and you're the Hasib J. Sabag Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. You're essentially living the American dream. I am living the American dream. Now, in, in all seriousness, this is something, and it's not just an economic issue. It's the whole package of uh, freedom of association, the freedoms, the, the idea that we live in a society where our government is accessible to us, where people can process their grievances through uh, ostensibly neutral institutions. And this is something that enough Americans have experienced that it makes common sense to them. So this kind of positive vision for the future elicits the loyalty of people. Nobody likes opening up their checkbook on April 15th, but this country has been pretty good to us, so most of us do. The second way in which leaders, well, they don't elicit the loyalty this way, they establish control over their population is through bribery. It's through bribery. Uh, they open up the vaults and they buy political quiescence. Uh, think about Qatar. Qatar, this tiny little country that has resources for as far as anybody can see. And at the end of each fiscal year, the emir cuts a check to 125,000 of his cousins in the amount of $160,000. That's pretty good. If you define politics as the control over the competition and distribution of resources, Qatar is a country with no politics. I, once I was just as a side, I was once in Doha, and I asked my host, I'd like to meet the opposition. Opposition, opposition, opposition. So they came up with this one guy, and we sat down, and I said, well, what is it that you want? He said, Dr. Steven, I'm happy, but I could be happier, which just proves my case <laughs> that um, this you know, check at the end of every fiscal year buys a certain amount of uh, political quiescence. Is it any coincidence that King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia opened up the coffers uh, just as Mubarak fell and invested $130 billion in his own uh, society? And for good measure, threw in $10 billion for the Omanis and another $10 billion for the Bahrainis, which are now a wholly owned subsidiary of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, the third way, the third way in which uh, leaders elicit, well, actually don't elicit, establish control over their people is through either the threat of force or the actual application of force. This is uh, the most expensive, the least efficient, and riskiest way of establishing control. And so if you have this framework of vision, bribery, and coercion, you can see what the problems are in the Middle East. Husni Mubarak of Egypt, didn't really have enough. He didn't have the, where, the financial wherewithal of the Emir of Qatar or the King of Saudi Arabia. He only had just enough to buy off certain amounts of people, certain groups of people, the constituency for his regime, who didn't crack until the very, very end. 
uh, he certainly didn't have a vision. The coda of the late Mubarak period was stability for the sake of development. That's not exactly something that brings tears to your eyes, makes you want to stand up and sing the national anthem, or write a check on tax day. Uh, and in fact, to make matters worse, the development that there was over the course of almost 30 years that Mubarak was in power was not shared by the vast majority of Egyptians. And the stability that they got was at the end of a rattan cane and metal truncheon of the internal security forces. And that's the key to why Egyptians ultimately overwhelmed Mubarak. I can't tell you why it happened at the beginning of 2011, why it happened on those dates, but I can tell you that this mix of vision, bribery, and coercion made it inevitable that it would happen because at some point, the Egyptian people were gonna determine that they were no longer afraid of Mubarak and the regime. And that's in fact exactly what people were saying those first few nights of the uprising when I was in Tahrir Square. Not only were they saying that Mubarak should join Ben Ali, not only were they demanding freedom and a more democratic system, but they were saying that they were no longer afraid. And the longer that they stayed in the square, or when they came back, when they were chased out, the more it convinced those people who were sitting on the fence, who supported what they were saying but were too afraid of the police, that the cost of going out to the streets and demanding change were not as great as people previously believed. And that's when you had the revolutionary bandwagon. More and more and more and more people changed their calculation of what the costs were for demanding change. Until by day 14, 15, 16, there were so many people out demanding change that it was more costly for some people not to go out in the streets than it was to stay home. And that's when everybody started burning their membership cards in the ruling National Democratic Party, which was neither national nor democratic nor much of a party. If any of you were listening to the forum this morning, I used that line too, so I apologize for the, uh, for the retweet. This is the key challenge for the post-Mubarak period, is how to switch that formula, how to have more vision, how to answer the key questions that Egyptians have been asking themselves for the better part of a century in a way that makes the most sense for Egyptians. Now, here's the good news about this. Since Mubarak's fall, Egyptians are mobilized. They are asking questions about what kind of society they want, what kind of government they want, what Egypt stands for, what its place in the world. Important questions about Egyptian identity that has been debated for the better part of the last 100 years. But for the first time, it's being debated in a relatively freer political environment. And Egyptians themselves have a chance to answer these questions themselves and write their own history as a result. And they are having this debate up and down Egypt, across the socioeconomic uh, spectrum, to various degrees of sophistication, they are having these debates. They are trying to answer these questions in ways that make the most sense to the most Egyptians. And the first step in that is not just the conversation, but it's been the recently completed elections for the lower house of the parliament, the People's Assembly. We're now upon the upper house elections, which began on Sunday. And we're moving into a constitution writing period, which should be a time in which Egyptians are trying to answer these questions in a way that makes the most sense for the most Egyptians. Now, previous Egyptian leaders have tried. Nasser tried to answer these questions through a series of ideas and principles that we came to know as Nasserism. And for a brief period in the 1950s and mid-1960s, it worked. Egyptians were uh, experiencing expanded economic opportunity, expanded educational opportunity. Egypt was more powerful on the world stage, having seemingly shrugged off foreign domination, which were things that Egyptians wanted. And Nasser seemed to be providing until the disaster of June 67 revealed these things actually to be hollow. His successor, Anwar Sadat, tried to fix the problems of the Nasser period. And he talked about a state of institutions, which was a euphemistic way of talking about a more democratic Egypt. He talked about prosperity through economic infita or openness. And he reoriented Egyptian foreign policy towards the West. Well, by the end of Sadat's reign, 
Egypt was no closer to becoming a democracy. Only very few people prospered under him. And the reorientation of Egyptian foreign policy made no sense to Egyptians. Mubarak didn't even try, as I said. It was all about stability for the sake of development. Now Egyptians are getting that opportunity. And they are mobilized, just as an aside. Um, as I've gotten older, I've grown less patient for standing online when I get to uh, Cairo to have my passport stamp. So, okay, I'll admit it, I hired a fixer to come and get me at the plane and get me through and drive me to the airport, et cetera, et cetera. And for years, for years, I've been trying to engage these two guys in a conversation about politics. On the way to my hotel, invariably, we would have passed the presidential compound, and I'd make some sort of snide flip remark about President Mubarak and whether he was going to live forever or something like that. And these guys were stone-faced silent, stone-faced silent. Now, in the six times that I've been back to Egypt since the uprising, I can't shut these guys up about politics. <laughs> All they want to do is talk about politics. All they want to do is all they do is argue about politics. So this is all very, very good news. It's exhilarating to watch. It's exhilarating to watch. Well, that's the good news. Now let me lay some of the bad news. All of this, for all of the exhilaration about the uh, debates that Egyptians are having and the opportunity, the, the opportunity they now have to really write their own history, it's coming against the backdrop of a collapsing economy. Uh, Egyptians have burned through 15 billion of 34 billion dollars in foreign currency reserves. Uh, the Suez Canal tolls are down because of the global economic downturn. Something like 10 percent of international trade flows through the Suez Canal. Um, tourism is down sharply from the almost 60 million people who visited Egypt in 2008, the last year that statistics were available. In fact, I have waiters who are fighting over who can pour me a cup of coffee in the morning because there really is no one in Egypt. And Egyptian workers abroad are holding on to their remittances because of there's so much uncertainty in Egypt. They're not sending money back, which has all had collectively a devastating effect on uh, the Egyptian uh, economy. The next challenge is the ongoing protest, the permanent revolution in Egypt. Um, very early on, in March of 2011, there was a referendum uh, that was held on critical changes to the existing e Egyptian constitution that would guide the transitional period. And for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into, but I could in Q&A if you really want to, the revolutionary groups that instigated the uprising was ag were against these amendments and campaigned against them. And uh, the outcome of the referendum was 76% of Egyptians who voted voted for the referendum, and the rest voted against. And it was clear to the revolutionaries from that point that they really weren't very good actually at politics. They may have been good at organizing and instigating an uprising, but they very, weren't very good, and they were up against some formidable obstacles, uh, some very seasoned uh, political operators, and they turned themselves into a permanent revolution. And over the course of the spring and the summer, we had 17 Fridays of. Remember during the uprising, you had Friday of rage, Friday of this, Friday. Well, in the spring and summer, we had Friday of protecting the revolution, Friday of persistence, Friday of persistence two, Friday of persistence of protecting the revolution, Friday of dignity of protecting the revolution. I mean, it became banal. I started naming my own Fridays. At the Council on Foreign Relations, we had Fridays off during the summer, so I had Friday of Jiffy Lube, Friday of going on vacation, Friday of picking the kids up at camp. Um, it really became a I protest, therefore I am kind of thing, which has subsequently morphed into something more sinister. Not necessarily the total fault of the revolutionaries, but things have turned violent. There was a week-long uh, battle between revolutionary groups and the military and the police forces in late November in the run-up to uh, the beginning of the People's Assembly elections. When I was in Cairo the last time in mid-December, uh, I was witness to the Battle of Qasr al-Aini Street. And I will tell you, there was no political point to this. It seemed like, it seemed like gang warfare. And having been in Tahrir at the beginning of the uprising, to me, this was a warped, bizarro world of Tahrir Square, where that was peaceful, mostly. And most of the violence was perpetrated by the regime. This was purposely violent, and it was something that I think is going to be an ongoing challenge. That's not to suggest that the revolutionaries are wrong. Uh, if I was Egyptian, I'd probably be part of this permanent revolution as well because of, I think, the third great challenge 
that Egyptians are facing right now, which is the role of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. You may remember prior to or just as uh, they were pushing Mubarak from power, uh, what became uh, the current military leadership in the form of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces is something that had existed before, but in its current iteration in executive authority in Egypt, said that they supported the legitimate demands of the Egyptian people. When in fact, everything they have done since suggests otherwise, suggests absolutely otherwise. In fact, what the Egyptian Armed Forces has demonstrated over the course of this past year is that they have a very different conception of social cohesion and political stability from what a democratic Egypt would look like. At best, it looks like a loyal opposition. The second thing that the Egyptian Armed Forces is after is protection of their rather robust economic interests. Egyptian military is engaged in the economy in big ways. Uh, if you drink Safi spring water, you are contributing to the Egyptian Armed Forces bottom line. When your plane is refueled at Cairo International Airport or any other airport in Egypt, you are contributing to the bottom line of the Egyptian Armed Forces because the aviation services company that services your airplane is owned by the military. Uh, if Egyptians buy a certain brand of kitchen equipment, seriously, they are contributing to the bottom line of the armed forces. Uh, if you stay in any number of resorts along the Red Sea coast, the Egyptian military would have reclaimed the land before selling it to a crony and everybody making a, a lot of money. I'm not even getting into the guns and stuff uh, like that. The key is, is that this economic conglomerate is beyond public oversight and enjoys subsidies and benefits, uh, but remains beyond the accounting of, uh, of the civilian leadership. And the military would like to hold on to these economic relations. And finally, I think most important, the military wants to remain the source of power, legitimacy, and authority in the Egyptian political system. The problem is that in a more democratic system, the people are the source of power, authority, and legitimacy. And I think this sets up three struggles in Egypt. And I'll go through this quickly, and then I'll do my last bit on the United States, and then we'll go to Q&A. Three struggles that will animate Egyptian politics in the next three, six, nine, 12, 16, 19, 24 months or so. One, over the economy. Everybody agrees that the economy is crashing. What to do about it is a different story. And for the most part, the people who support the neoliberal economic reforms that Mubarak pursued over the course of arguably the last eight years of his rule are either in jail or on the run in Dubai, London, or Beirut. Even though the Muslim Brotherhood, which now has a plurality in the parliament, made up of good capitalists, there is a revolutionary narrative that says that these neoliberal economic reforms helped enable the kind of crony capitalism and corruption and the huge gulf between rich and poor in Egypt. Whether it's true or not, this is the widely held perception. And there is going to be tremendous political pressure for the newly elected Egyptian leaders to pursue different economic policies as a result. The second struggle is, and this isn't just book marketing because the book is called The Struggle for Egypt. I honestly think that these are going to be struggles, is writing the Constitution. They can't even agree on who's going to select the Committee of 100 to write this Constitution that's supposed to be written in the next six months in a deeply polarized society that is supposed to answer some very important questions about identity in Egypt. And relating to this is going to be the relationship between the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and the parliament. Going into these elections, the military wanted two seemingly contradictory things. They wanted big turnout so that they could say that great mythical silent majority of Egyptians approve of their handling of this transitional period, and that they would be vindicated by what they have done over the course of the last year. And they wanted a weak parliament. Well, they got the big turnout in the form of 52, anywhere from 52 to 60 percent of the Egyptian people who turned out to vote, eligible voters who turned out to vote. That's about 52 to 60 percent better than Mubarak elections held under Mubarak. 
So the leaders of the new People's Assembly can legitimately claim to have a popular mandate. The fact that the leaders of the new parliament are members of the Muslim Brotherhood only raises the stakes for the military. Not because these are totally different organizations and so on and so forth, but actually because they're rather similar. They both make claims about being nationalist par excellence. They both make claims about being good economic stewards of the country. They both make claims about being legitimate leaders of Egypt. And on each one of those scales, actually, actually, from an objective perspective, the Brotherhood looks better. The Brotherhood absolutely looks better, which leads me to this question about the United States and Egypt and the Middle East. Let's face it. In this new era, regardless of what happens in Egypt, whether it's some sort of fuzzy, warm democracy on the Nile or some sort of reconstituted uh, authoritarian system, uh, as the political scientist from the University of Washington, Ellis Goldberg, calls it, Mubarakism without Mubarak, the party is over for the United States. Public opinion matters in new and different ways, not only in Egypt, but throughout the Middle East. And the era of making side, deal, side deals with regional authoritarians who would carry our very unpopular water in the Middle East with the expectation that they would control their populations is now over, is now over. Egypt, along with Morocco and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and the small Gulf states, was a linchpin of a regional political order that made it relatively easier and relatively less expensive for the United States to pursue its interests in the Middle East. Well, we, things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. And I think the onus is on the United States to adjust to the new reality. The worst thing we could possibly do is try to manage, influence, and shape transitions going on in the Middle East. We might do more harm than good. And if asked, and from time to time, people have asked me my opinion, people who count, supposedly. My answer is less is more in terms of future American foreign policy. We need to be mindful of our history in a place like Egypt. We've done wonderful things in Egypt, built infrastructure, made it possible for Egyptians to drink potable water in rural areas, given them electricity, uh, had wonderful programs for rural farmers, uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But the revolutionary narrative is that we were the primary patron of a military-dominated system whose leaders abused and brutalized their own people. And that's why we need to take a step back, however briefly. I'll end on a positive spin to this. If Egypt is halfway successful in achieving what Egyptians want domestically, and it's halfway successful in carving out a foreign policy that's more independent of the United States, and thereby recapturing at least some of its lost influence in the region. And after all, its lost influence was directly related to the perception by its own people and people in the region that Mubarak was just a client of the United States. So if they're successful in carving out a more independent foreign policy, Egypt will be a more appropriate interlocutor for the United States in the Middle East than one that is perceived to be nothing more than, as I said, a client of the United States. We've seen kind of a popular uprising be very successful in a short amount of time of overthrowing a government that's been in power for a very long period of time. But very quickly, we recognize that there are uh, huge challenges in not just governing, but creating institutions to govern. Um, and I know you've written about this. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what are some of the, the milestones we should be looking for uh, or some of the things that we should be watching out for in the, in the short to medium term to see whether or not this is going down a path that was perhaps envisioned by, by the popular uprising to begin with? Well, uh, a couple of reactions to the question, which is a great question. Um, I don't know whether it was yours or, or someone else's, but it was, it's a terrific question. I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that, you know, in, in, in a rational moment, we're all preaching patience, and the Egyptians are preaching patience, but we don't have any. It's only been a year since they brought down Mubarak. And the regime that he led had been there for 60 years. It's going to take a very long time to uproot the Egyptian national security state and build something else. 
And this is a struggle that is going to take not months. We, we're not going to get together January 30th, 2013, and we'll have this conversation and say, well, everything's great in Egypt now. This is a multi-year thing, three, five, a decade, maybe more. There's a reason why I called uh, the book The Struggle for Egypt. And maybe by the time they get things right, I'll be on the 15th edition. But uh, the, the, the point is, is that we should be uh, cognizant of the fact that this is um, something that is going to uh, uh, unfold over many, uh, many years. And that there are going to be exhilarating steps forward and depressing steps back and a lot of going sideways uh, in between. I think in the short run, the things that we need to look for are the handover to civilian government, which is supposed to happen in June and July, which was supposed to happen in June and July 2013, but the revolutionaries put enough pressure on uh, the military leaders to move that up by a year. Now, that seems like a good thing, but it's we're on a very short time frame here. We've got to write a constitution, elect a president, and hand over power to civilians. The constitution writing process will be another marker for uh, how things happen. And then what happens? in the People's Assembly, I think will be extraordinarily important. I think that there's a, there's a sense that Egyptians don't know how to do politics. I think they do know how to do politics. But we'll have to see what kind of coalitions are formed, what kind of issues uh, uh, the, the fringes uh, force on uh, that moderate center that, that uh, occupies um, the, the parliament right now. It is not going to be easy. It's not going to be pretty. But there are some things. On, on foreign policy, I think we will see uh, what we are seeing, an evolution of Egyptian foreign policy, an evolution of Egypt's relationship with Hamas, for example. Uh, what's going on now between the United States and Egypt, and what will happen with the aid package that uh, we have been giving Egypt since the early uh, 1980s uh, are important markers for, uh, for foreign policy. Maybe we can s stick around there for a bit, uh, particularly on the domestic politics, and maybe you can expand on, on your remarks about um, how is all of this going to work? Uh, the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafis, the, the, the more liberal uh, uh, coalitions that are forming, um, what, ca what should we be expecting about how they can all work together, how that might uh, 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 impact the constitutional drafting process, um, and then, and then there have been a lot of questions. If you can roll this in, on what this means for religious minorities. What does this mean for the Jews and the and the Baha'is and the and the Coptics that that reside in Egypt, and, and what can they expect um, going forward? Well, uh, if the first procedural session of the uh, People's Assembly or any uh, any guide, it's not going to go well because it promptly broke into a fist fight. So. Um, it's going to be a problem. Uh, like I said, I think Egyptians know how to, know how to play politics, but uh, this is very new for a, a lot of people. If you do the math between the, the party of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Freedom and Justice Party, and the Salafist and Noor Party, uh, some strain of Islam's control, 66% of the policy, which just has people's hair on fire. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be a mistake to suggest that the parliament is going to be dominated by an Islamist bloc. Uh, the people from Anur don't love the people from the Muslim Brotherhood and vice versa. And I think there are going to be some issues where the Muslim Brotherhood may be forced to take uh, positions that it might not want to out of sheer pragma pragmatism over this intense battle over who speaks for Islam and who's a good Muslim, which is always framed by more extreme elements in which there is no w – is very difficult uh, to argue against. And then I think there are going to be other issues – where the Brotherhood or even the Salafists line up with liberals to box out maybe the Brotherhood or, or others. I Wh think what are some of those issues? Ben? Well, I, I think on uh, pragmatic issues related to, for example, foreign policy. I don't think that the Brotherhood immediately wants to breach the Egypt-Israel peace treaty. I think they want changes to it. Uh, and I think that uh, Salafis may have a different view of it on the question of Minority rights. I think for purely pragmatic reasons, the Brotherhood may not be interested in striking a, a more uh, a, a tougher line on this, so that they may line up with more uh, liberal elements. I do think, however, that um, it's unclear where the Brotherhood actually stands on some of these critical issues related to minority rights, the role of women, 
Uh, and I do think that those are issues that the Salafists are going to try to outmaneuver them and force them to take uh, positions, whether they agree with them or not. Um, by and large, though, I think we can expect Egyptian domestic politics to change, some for the better, some that will, in some areas, it'll be unnerving. And without a doubt, Egyptian foreign policy is going to change because the arrangement between Mubarak and the United States was so deeply and profoundly unpopular, and the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel was so profoundly unpopular, made Egyptians feel weak, uh, rendered them a secondary or second-rate power in the region. To Egyptian, to us, when we think about the Egypt-Israel peace treaty, we think of that iconic photo of President Carter, President Sadat, and Prime Minister Begin all shaking hands together. But for many Egyptians, it is a separate piece and therefore a shameful piece. Um, they do recognize the benefits of it, but they see it as having sidelined the Egyptians so both the United States and Egypt, um, the United States and Israel can pursue their interests unfettered in the region. And they can enumerate, and I go into some detail about this in my book, all of the things that the Israelis have done since the peace treaty that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do had it not been for the peace treaty. I think that makes sense. Maybe you can also talk a little bit about the foreign policy within the region. Uh, you're you're a, a, a noted scholar of, of Turkish issues as well. Are there some lessons there uh, that would correspond between Turkey and Egypt, both uh, having uh, long histories and in, in, in military rule in, in the political sphere as well? What, what can we draw from the Turkish experience that might inform what, what might happen in Egypt? You're asking Turkish model questions. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I'm glad you're all sitting down, except for those of you who are standing up. You know, the model for Egypt, get this, is Egypt. Um, I don't think that we can have a lively discussion about the Turkish model. And in fact, my first book uh, teases out the important similarities between Egypt, Turkey, and Algeria, particularly stemming from uh, military domination. But let's say, for argument's sake, that we all decide here, we're all of us, we're very smart people, we decide Turkey is a model for Egypt. Then what? What is the implication of that? Do we start on some massive international social engineering project to make Egyptians speak Turkish? Uh, you know, there really doesn't seem to me to be much to this idea of, uh, of a, a, a Turkish model other than as a filler for us to say something when we're dumbfounded by reality. And in fact, we build models, we build models to simplify, to simplify a reality that we don't quite understand. And that's, in that way, political scientists like myself really want to be economists, because we can build models and make inferences about them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be too flip. I do think that there are things um, that uh, uh, Egyptians in this transition period look to Turkey for, in particular, they, they admire the, the, the foreign policy independence of Turkey. And they admire that uh, the Turkish parliament is a real parliament. But ultimately, Egyptians are going to want to uh, develop uh, a new political system in keeping with Egyptian history and Egyptian society. And after all, this is a proud country. 81 million people, inheritors of a great civilization. They should be able to do it without having to look towards some model from some other country that used to be the colonial power there. Uh, was a foreign domination something that Egyptians have been responding to for the better part of, I don't know how long, but certainly in the realm, in the struggle for Egypt, more than, more than, uh, more than a century. So I think it's, it's interesting to talk about. While the uprising was going on, I, I, I did a blog post in my blog, um, which is called From the Potomac to the Euphrates, in which I said, you know, the, Egypt, the Turkish armed forces as a model, beware of false analogies. And in fact, in Turkey, Turkey made great democratic strides, some of which they are now reversing, uh, by the way, uh, not because of the military, but despite the military. And I think uh, we should be cognizant of that when we talk about models. When, when you looked at the, 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 the protests in Tahrir Square last year, you found, as, as you noted, uh, a lot of young people, uh, which is common, a, lo a lot of young people who are frustrated uh, didn't have opportunity, uh, wanted not just a political voice, but a better economic life for themselves going forward. Uh, 
this is still a challenge, obviously. Uh, there still persists a, a, a youth bulge in, in Egypt and, 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 frankly, across the Middle East. But how, how are these issues going to be addressed? How are these econ socioeconomic issues, do you think, are going to be addressed by the incoming government? Is, are they cognizant about the, the scale of the, of the challenge here? And, and if so, what, what are they thinking about how to address it? You know, this is something that I've heard a lot about, um, about, you know, what Tahrir Square was about. And, and, and I'm not so Marxist about it. I don't, I don't think this was, at least in its initial stages, an uprising about economic opportunity. Um, w when I was in Tahrir Square, there were a lot of young, it seemed to me, upper middle class and middle class people with, you know, cell phones that I would be love to have. Um, cool droid stuff and iPhones and things like that that I don't have. Um, and I, what to me was uh, most important was their demands for things that make us feel warm and safe when we go to sleep at night. Um, it is ideas about freedom and justice and democracy and, and, and governments that are responsible and responsive to their people. There is a, me a genuine mechanism in which to change uh, leaders. Certainly, uh, a very, very tough economic environment for the vast majority of Egyptians created an environment of misery that helped make this uh, uprising happen. But in fact, it, it wasn't until a number of days later that labor really got engaged because labor was something that was one, not quite a constituency, but was one group that Mubarak was actually afraid of, and he kept buying them up and kept buying them up and kept buying them up until this uprising where they married up their economic grievances with a perverse political order that gave a lot of energy after the first five days or so of the uprising. In fact, you know, uh, on even the second day, I remember that there was this pitched battle between the troops of the Central Security Forces and the revolutionaries, and then on Galah Street, the Battle of Galah Street, and and which is adjacent to a uh, to a middle, a, you know, a blue collar neighborhood, and it was amazing. All of a sudden, this whole neighborhood joined in to defeat these central security, and that was the beginning of the secretion of average Egyptians joining this upper middle class group of kids. A and I'm not saying I can't. Not everybody who was there on the first couple of nights were upper middle class kids, but it was certainly organized and instigated by by these people. So. It's hard to say it was about economics. Ultimately, it was, but I think this was really an uprising about ideas and about democracy and wanting to live in a better, in a, under better political system. But looking forward, of course. Oh yes, the second part of yeah. your question. Um, I spent all that time debunking the the Marxist myths about economics driving politics. Um, I think that um, this is, as I pointed out in in my remarks, going to be a tremendous struggle, because there is a, a sense that. You know, in a way, in the abstract, in a vacuum, the neoliberal economic reforms that Mubarak pursued over the course of his last eight years in power did produce macroeconomic results. Very, very impressive macroeconomic results. It was a perverse political and legal order that made it possible for the corruption and the crony capitalism and all uh, of, the th uh, of the things that people complain about. And in fact, if you look at the World Bank data, which is a bit suspect because they were based on Egyptian numbers, but if you take it at face value, the delta between rich and poor did ac didn't actually increase during those years, uh, unlike in Russia or China or India, other high growth countries, which suggested that maybe Egyptian economic reformers were doing the right thing or they were cooking the books, one or the other. Um, but uh, in the abstract, these, these reforms seem to have worked. The problem is this revolutionary narrative about these reforms and, and that bringing the average Egyptian to his knees, about impoverishing the country in order to become an emerging market featured in Business Week. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that there is going to be, again, I think labor and the left, you know, the Berlin Wall fell and everybody thought, well, the labor and left were done. I don't know how about it here in Berkeley, but it's still, or here in Northern California, but um, you know, it's very, very strong in Egypt. It's actually strong in, in other parts of the region as well. And there is this narrative, and there is going to be a lot of political pressure to invest in things that Egypt, Egyptians can't afford right now. And I think they're banking on the fact that nobody's going to let this leaky boat sink. Hmm. Turning to uh, U.S. relations, you, you spoke quite a bit about um, your thoughts on U.S. relations uh, with respect to Egypt. 
maybe you can give us your evaluation of the Obama administration, um, pre Tahrir Square, during, now post. Um, what would be your recommendation if you were sitting in the Oval Office with the president saying what the U.S. posture should be towards Egypt? You know, I know you lived in Washington, D.C. for a bunch <laughs> of years. I'll tell you why. Because the, the great parlor game post-uprising was, can you please grade the Obama administration's handling of the Arab uprisings, and does this have anything to do with the Bush administration's freedom agenda? That was going to be my next question. Yes, of course. <laughs> So my answer to that is N.A., not applicable, and B, very unlikely. Um, I think that, um, look, I think that they were clearly behind the curve at the beginning. Uh, you know, the calls at the beginning for the time for reform is now. If you're on the ground, you saw how hollow this was. But how would they know? I mean, the embassy was on lockdown. Um, they didn't know. We don't do the kinds of things that we, we often do. And I think that prior to the uprising, uh, the administration was resigned to the fact that Mubarak was there, seemingly stable. This is someone that they had to do business with. And that the problems that the Bush administration encountered with Mubarak uh, were problems that were uh, unnecessary. Uh, and that, uh, uh, of course, they didn't like the fact that Mubarak was seemingly grooming his son in the corruption. But this is what it was. When it came to the uprising, I think they were there was no precedent for this, no playbook. This had never happened before. People want to make this 1989. 1989's got nothing on this. People in Eastern and Central Europe wouldn't want it to be part of the West. President George H.W. Bush had partners in Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and Francois Mitterrand to help with a soft landing in, in Eastern Europe. By and large, the people in the Middle East don't want to be a part of the West. They want to be a part of they want to write their own history. They want to they want to be themselves. And, and who are President Obama's allies in, in, a, in, a, in a soft landing? Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu of, Egypt, of, of Israel? Yeah. He's, he doesn't look kindly upon democracy in, in the Middle East because of the perception of what that means for Israeli security. King Abdullah of, of Jordan, who is on the run himself, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, uh, not, I mean, a progressive in Saudi terms, perhaps, <laughs> But I don't, think I don't think the Saudis want Egypt to be too democratic. Um, and, 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 and Tayyip Erdogan of, of Turkey, who only wants to be Gamal Abdel Nasser. So this is not really a, a, an all-star cast to help with a soft landing <laughs> in, in, in the Middle East. So uh, the administration is essentially on its own. And given that there's no precedent and no playbook, they're making it up as, uh, as they go along, as one would expect. I think the administration has an aspiration for a more democratic Middle East to emerge, yet recognizes the tension that the people that they currently do business with are not necessarily progressive liberal mm. Democrats. Mm. And um, they are feeling their way. There has been struggles within the administration about how to pursue it. My answer to them, and the answer that I give, although not so explicitly in the struggle for Egypt, is we need to take a historical view of this. We need to situate what is happening now in the broader sweep of Egyptian and Middle Eastern history. And my message is, be mindful of that history. Be mindful of the fact that while this was not an uprising about the U.S.-Egypt relationship, it was an uprising about dignity and self-empowerment. And the relationship with us made Egyptians feel weak mm. and made them feel collectively like they had no dignity. And as a result, they're going to want to pursue an independent foreign policy. And as a result, we should take a step back. And as uncomfortable as it may be, as we may not necessarily like the outcomes, we have to let Egyptians work out these key antecedent questions about their identity on their own. We may hurt ourselves if we weigh into a debate that we don't really understand and that we don't have any kind of historical appreciation for. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, was because a lot of the debates and arguments and policy discussions in, in Washington and elsewhere, to be honest with you, happen in a vacuum. There are these ahistorical things. Like, what are you talking about? If you understood the history, you wouldn't be saying things like this. Now, my friends who serve in the current administration or have served in previous administrations say to me, look, this is very wise, but you clearly have never served in government. <laughs> um, and which is true. What do, what do people do in government? They 
sit around the table in the policy process and they fight over their resources because in the government, you don't get rewarded for saving resources. You have to spend your resources to justify your existence. And most of the time, that becomes the goal because you want to get the same budget or more the next year and so on and so forth, regardless of what the implications are because you need to justify your existence. <laughs> so now you know well, why we sometimes make mistakes. L let's, let's end with this. Um, if you were an investor investing in Egypt, uh, would you invest now? Would you be investing in six months, a year? Are you a bull or a bear? What's going on? <laughs> this is a bad question to ask me. I've had one good investment in my life. <laughs> I, I, I moved to New York in 2004, and I said either Mayor Mike is giving these things out or the iPod is the greatest invention on the face of the earth, and so it motivated me to buy Apple at 66. Other than that, I've been a disaster. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know, I don't know, it was literally one, you know, a, 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 a clock, a stop clock is right twice a day. I, look, I think that over the long term, Egypt has a lot of promise. If you look at human capital, at what the potential is for Egypt, and, and the history of Egypt, and the fact that there is, it's not rich, but there were proto-democratic institutions, and that Egypt has been a center of cultural production and knowledge. It has also been the font, the intellectual font of transnational jihadism, uh, as well as all these these nice things. That you know, on balance, I wouldn't put my you know entire retirement, my children's uh, my children's education uh, funds into Egypt. But if I had a little bit of play money. And I'm willing to tolerate risk. I certainly would I I invest in Egypt. I think it has a more promising future than people think. But it's going to be a multi-year struggle. You're going to have to be able to fasten your seatbelt and deal with the bumps that come along the way. There's going to be a fair amount of uncertainty, a fair amount of instability, and potentially marked by spasms of violence like we saw in late November and, and mid-December going forward. But um, over the long run, I think Egyptians have what it takes. Just because they don't have a rich tradition of democracy doesn't necessarily make it impossible for them to become a democracy. But their democracy is not going to look like our democracy or a Swiss democracy or Turkish democracy or whatever. It's going to look like Egyptian democracy, whatever that is. Anyway, thank you very, very much. It was a great pleasure to be with you tonight.